As winter settles in, millions of Afghans are desperate for food and medical supplies. Hello, I'm Arnold Naidu and this is The Heat. Nearly four months after the Taliban seized power, Afghanistan is facing a growing humanitarian and economic crisis. Aid organizations warn a million children could die of acute malnutrition in the coming months. Hundreds of Afghans marched in the streets of Kabul on Tuesday with banners reading, Let us eat and give us our frozen assets. In August, the United States froze more than $9 billion in reserves belonging to the Afghan Central Bank. The lack of funding has crippled Afghanistan's already troubled economy. State employees from doctors to teachers have not been paid in months. The United Nations says the country is on the brink of a catastrophe. The people of Afghanistan today face a profound humanitarian crisis that threatens the most basic of human rights. Economic life is largely paralyzed with the collapse of the banking system and a severe liquidity crisis. With winter having arrived, Women, men, boys and girls face severe poverty and hunger and limited and deteriorating public services, particularly health care. As more Afghans struggle to meet their basic needs, people in vulnerable situations, notably women-headed households and children, are being pushed to take desperate measures, including child labor, the marriage of children to ensure their survival, and according to some reports, even the sale of children. For more now on the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan, let's bring in our panel. Joining us from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, is Omar Sadr. He is a senior research fellow with the Center for Governance and Markets at the University of Pittsburgh. Also with us from Milan, Italy, is Haroun Rahimi. He's an associate professor at the American University of Afghanistan. From Geneva, Switzerland, Barbar Baluch is the global spokesperson for Asia and Pacific for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. And Suleiman bin Shah served as Deputy Minister with the Ministry of Industry and Commerce in Afghanistan. He joins us from Kabul. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And Suleiman bin Shah, let me start with you. As we've just been hearing, the humanitarian situation in Afghanistan is deteriorating day by day. In fact, the United Nations has reported that up to 23 million people are in desperate need of food. Here is the spokesman for the World Food Program, Thompson Perry. Let's listen. An estimated 98% of Afghans are not consuming enough food, uh, which is a worrisome 17% increase uh, since August. Now, the spiraling economic crisis, the conflict and drought has meant the average family can now barely cope. So, Suleiman, uh, this situation might vary from region to region, but what are you seeing there? What is your assessment of the situation? I think the situation right now is almost becoming unbearable to watch. Every day you can see, you know, millions of Afghans who are literally paralyzed just because men or women in Washington and other capitals of the world like Doha, Islamabad, Kabul itself made certain decisions that has made life miserable for Afghans. And, and this is a very unfortunate situation. For the last four months, we have literally seen a degrading lifestyle in Kabul. People do not access, do not have access to their own money in the accounts. And at the end of the day, the Afghan people or Af Afghan nation are just thinking whether they need the world or not, simply not, because, because the situation that they're experiencing right now is extremely unique, very different than any other crisis that we have experienced in the past. And, and because men-made decisions brought this situation, the frustration of Afghan people is extremely high, all times high, I would say. There is a shortage of the basics, uh, Suleiman, things like food, medicines, and as you just pointed out, these, there's no liquidity, there's no money in the economy right now. But what about security in the country? Uh, what is uh, your view on that? Is it uh, secure right now? Well, again, it's a very, you know, gray picture. Uh, if we would say that you, could you travel in Afghanistan now freely just because you had economic uh, security worries in the past, we, I would say yes. I have traveled to several provinces myself. And so traveling or going inside the remote areas of Afghanistan has become really possible now. But there are still reports and incidents, excuse me, and specific cases 
where Afghans are still being, uh, you know, harassed. They are being targeted. There are still reports of killings, target killings, and and, and some insecurity incidents as well in in uh, parts of Afghanistan. For example, recently in Nangar Harvey, a couple of incidents. So. Uh, Security-wise speaking, yes, we have improved a lot, but otherwise we have failed. You know, the the whole financial system came to a pause after August 15, and the subsequent decisions made by IMF and World Bank, the United States government, and others have simply added to the challenges of Afghans. You know, just living simple life in Afghanistan. In all these, you know, in relation to seeing the security aspect. It's very hard for somebody to just calculate and, you know, weigh the value, whether we would, were nicer in the war or all we miserable in the peace. It's a very difficult comparison, I would say. Barbara Baluch, uh, the country needs help. There are some international efforts underway to help the country, uh, despite the fact that the United States has frozen almost $10 billion of money that belongs to the Afghan people. Uh, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, as well as representatives from China, the United States, Russia, and the UN met in Islamabad last week to address the humanitarian situation in the country. What came of that meeting? I can't tell you the conclusion of all the, the meetings that have been taking place, and we have been hearing the, the right noises from all across, as, as my other colleague on the panel was saying. Mm -hmm. I'm coming out of Kabul and Afghanistan, and I was there uh, till end of the last month, and I saw what was described in your reports by my own eyes. Afghanistan has been through many shock waves. This is probably the worst of all. And the humanitarian impact of the failure of politics, or whichever way we want to, to, to say it, is so evident. I met mothers who have not eaten for days. I mean, colleagues coming back from the hospitals are telling us that they are seeing children who have no energy left to laugh or cry. And then you have the elderly who are left to look after uh, uh, you know, youngsters, orphans, their grandchildren. And yes, we as the, uh, the, the UN Refugee Agency, we have been standing with the Afghan people and Afghanistan inside Afghanistan and in the region for the last 40 years. We help each week at least 70,000 Afghans, desperate Afghans, the most of the vulnerable. But as you walk around, you see so many other people who are in the need of humanitarian assistance. I mean, we do what we can do, but humanitarian aid today cannot solve Afghan's problem. Harun Rahimi, you know, as we've been hearing there, this has been a failure of politics. Uh, we look at the uh, billions of dollars which have been frozen by the United States, as Suleiman bin Shah pointed out to us. I mean, that is a man-made decision. That's, you know, that's happened because of decisions taken here uh, in Washington. Um, that money, the $10 billion, is frozen. Most of it is in U.S. banks. But there are efforts here to get that money released. Forty Democrats, and we should remember that these are Democrats, these are the same party as President Biden, have called on the United States Treasury to release those funds in order to prevent what they have called an imminent mass starvation. The United States says, for its part, that it will release those funds, but the Taliban has to announce a more inclusive government. Uh, there has to be um, more uh, rights for women and girls to go to school, to get educated, uh, etc. I mean, what are we to make of this situation? I mean, I, I would agree with other panelists. There have been a lot of talks, but very little tangible, concrete actions. And we are running against the clock here. The winter is upon us. People are suffering now. Um, and it's, the, the time works both ways. Uh, Taliban are asking for more time to meet the international community's demands. And the international community is, uh, and the United States, as you referenced in the statements, is asking for more time to observe whether Taliban will comply with, uh, with their promises or not. But the fact is, there's really no time left. And um, the re removing suffering, reducing suffering, should be number one priority. In terms of what needs to be done, it's a complex picture. Really, there is no panacea. Um, on the humanitarian front, sanctions have been the, the biggest challenge. There's not an issue of funding. Many The funding exists, but it's been very hard and difficult to get it into the country. 
some progress has been made, some shipments of USD made into the country, and some exemptions uh, were granted by the uh, U.S. Treasury as well as the U.N. Uh, today. So there's been a little bit of progress on that front. When it gets to the issue of basic services, health, education, um, the challenge has been both sanctions and funding, and they uh, both have to be addressed at the same time. Um, and what complicates the issue of delivery of services is the need for Taliban to be involved, uh, because without the approval, at least tacit approval of the Taliban, their cooperation, it is simply impossible to continue the uh, life the services that people are dependent on to stay alive in the country. But a broader picture is just that the country, as was discussed earlier, cannot survive on aid alone. There is a need for an economy to actually function. Mm -hmm. And that brings up the issue of sanctions again. Uh, humanitarian exemptions are needed, absolutely must, but they will not solve Afghanistan problem. There is a need for the trade to happen in the country, for investment to be taken, able to take place in the country. And all of these require action by all stakeholders, including Taliban and the international community. But both parties have been basically dragging their feet, uh, putting the burden on the other side. Um, as I put it once, they, are, they seem to be in a steering contest to see who would uh, uh, flinch first. And millions of lives are at stake. Omar Sadr, at this point, no country has recognized the Taliban government in Afghanistan. And the Taliban itself has warned that if recognition is not forthcoming soon, the situation will get worse, not just for Afghanistan, but for the region as well. Uh, here is the country's acting foreign minister talking. Let's listen. As you know, across the world it is accepted that if a government has people and a power over their people, and if they can maintain security, this government has the right to be officially recognized. Now, as our government is not recognized, this is an act of oppression. And also the rights of Afghan people are being deprived. We must also be given our people's right. The sanctions which are over Afghanistan must be removed. So, Omar, there we heard it there from uh, the acting foreign minister saying that the rights of the Afghan people are being deprived uh, by the fact that the uh, government there is uh, not recognized. In fact, if you listen to that speech, you hear the Taliban actually saying, well, look, it's not up to us. It's other parties that are holding this up. Um, in the meantime, millions of Afghans are starving. Uh, how does one break this logjam? I think uh, the Taliban cleverly uh, play a kind of skipboarding game here. Well, they do not acknowledge their own responsibility. The primary responsibility goes to the Taliban, as they were responsible for the failure of the state on 15th of August, lack of a political settlement, which would have facilitated a smooth transition of power and prevented collapse of institutions. Uh, this Taliban, they have been uh, given warnings about this, and but they were not cautious of this. That's number one. At the same time, I think, um, we need to think about how international community has failed now to come with certain frameworks to order some of such kind of crisis in 21st century in Afghanistan, which is happening. I mean, there is lack of clear legal frameworks, political will, um, and many other uh, uncertainties within the, for example, United Nations system, but also the way um, some of the global powers do not behave responsibly. I mean, it is somehow both ways. Um, uh, at the local level, it is the Taliban who are responsible, but at internationally, I mean, sanctions, it, the state had certain assets. Um, many a small or medium level businesses were not dependent on, for example, any sort of aid or donation, but because of the sanctions, now no one can access their own, for example, their own uh, money or uh, reserves that they have. So that's right. why, I mean, uh, it's much more complicated but, uh, but skipping from the responsibility, the Taliban cannot blame the rest mm -hmm. for it. I mean, and also we need to be cautious of the fact to what extent the Taliban have this technocratic or bureaucratic capacity to run the state. Let's mm -hmm. say if we release funds, there could be alternative ways, for example, establishing an alternative trust fund so that, for example, we can pay the salaries of civil servants or yeah. the teachers or the medical aid workers, but at the same time do not reinforce the Taliban, because you can pay easily the money to the Taliban, but they have uh, over, for example, tens of thousands militants that they have to pay for, for their own militants, right? 
So yeah. they can misuse these funds. And unfortunately, I see that even the United Nations has moved forward to release some or call for some $6 million in order to finance the Ministry of Interior Affairs of the Taliban. Right. right. Um, and and that, that does not help the people. That does yeah. only help a, a factionalist, fundamentalist, militant movement. Suleiman bin Shah, you are there in Kabul. You see the impact of these sanctions um, right there, uh, day by day. Um, we know that state workers have not been paid. The same for doctors and teachers. People have to borrow money for food and for vital medicines. Um, I mean, can you give us a sense of what daily life is like in a place like Kabul? It's full of frustration. It's, it's a, you know, to be very frank with you, we had our first snowfall of the season just two days ago. Everybody was joyful. Even the lady who was standing barefoot on that snow, begging for her, for her kids, even she was happy. But I can tell you this, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's again very unfortunate that human-made decisions have, have brought this, this situation. It, I cannot tell you who is responsible, to be honest with you, whether the foreigners or the Afghans themselves or international community or whoever. But I can tell you this, we do not produce weapons. We're not a ammunition producing country. We do not produce bullets. We do not produce guns. We produce the best pomegranates. We produce the best pine nuts. We produce world's, world quality saffron. You know, it's recognized by so many certification bodies. So my point here is that just like Professor Rahimi said, we do not need aid really to, to become sustainable. You know, we need more trade. And, and that's what we were seeking for in the past few months when the previous government was still there, that we have to have a peace where trade can flourish, where economy can flourish. And that was the absolute objective, ultimate objective of mm -hmm. whatever was happening. The most unfortunate thing is just like, you know, Omar said, you know, there are some countries who are behaving irresponsibly or indifferently. So, you, you know, there could be an argument where to put the blame, whether locally or outside. But I would say this, you know, that at the end of the day, it's millions of people, it's kids, it's women, and so many other things that we have to look and we have to take into consideration while making these decisions. And, and, and just like Professor said again, you know, we're running against the clock and, and we have to make certain decisions. I mean, the capitals have to make certain decisions to make sure that the Afghan people are heard. Otherwise, I think the disconnect between Afghanistan and the world would grow. And every fear that we have right now and the experts have right now will definitely grow. Babar Baluch, there are also something like 3.5 million Afghans who are internally displaced uh, in the country. And as you pointed out to us earlier on, you've been working there. You've been working among them. Um, what kind of help are they getting? I mean, what of their fate? Indeed. I mean, Afghanistan is a story, sadly, of mass displacement, hunger, starvation, and all the economic hardships that, that we have been counting. It's not only 3.5 million Afghans that have been displaced uh, by continued conflict and insecurity. Add to that 1.5 million or 2 million more that have been displaced by drought and natural disasters. So we are looking at a picture of 5.5 million uh, Afghans who are displaced inside their country. And Afghanistan today has a population of at least an estimated 40 million people. And that's where we are repeating that the focus has to stay on the ordinary Afghans to be helped. What we are doing, I mean, for those are, who are displaced, we are trying uh, to rush supplies for everyday living. Winter was mentioned. The cold weather is harsh in Afghanistan and it can kill people. So we are rushing supplies like blankets, uh, like tarpaulins, like shelter materials to help Afghans, but also trying to assist them with some cash. You asked uh, my colleague earlier in terms of how life is for an ordinary Afghan. It's tough, it's harsh, but those who are displaced, they are being crushed. I met a young mother who had a six-month-old child, a 12-year-old son and a 10-year-old daughter. The husband has been killed in fighting. She's in Kabul, she's displaced. She has to go 
out apart from depending on our help she has to go out to uh, try to find some work she has to send her 12 year old child to search for refuse and plastic and sell them. And this is, when we say this is normal work, this is not normal work that you report every day and you get paid. Mm -hmm. It's there sometimes, it's not there sometimes. So life for Afghans is really tough. And then when you talk to Afghans inside Afghanistan, when they raise their eyes, they ask a question and they say, does the world care for them? Haroon, uh, you know, listening to what conditions are like in Afghanistan right now, it seems that the country is being held hostage right now to international politics. As I pointed out earlier on, the Taliban government has not been recognized by any other country in the world. So something needs to happen right now to get supplies, to get food to people. I mean, there are organizations and countries that are helping, the United Nations, as... Uh, Baba Baluch just pointed out to us, sending some supplies in. China has been sending supplies in, winter supplies, things like blankets, clothing. It's also sent in almost a million doses of the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, but what happens now? As you said, I mean, the decisions uh, in the foreign capitals uh, seem to be driven by their own perception of interest in the country, which has... Uh, dramatically uh, declined since the departure of foreign forces from Afghanistan. Many countries simply want to move on, including the United States. And they don't want to take responsibility for the results of their policies and actions for the people of Afghanistan who, have the cho who don't have the choice to leave. I think immediately the first um, priority is obviously humanitarian aid. At the very least, countries have to uh, uh, remove barriers for the flow of aid into Afghanistan. That uh, includes making sure that sanctions do not impede humanitarian delivery of humanitarian aid. That includes Taliban respecting the integrity of the aid delivery. Uh, that includes the country in the region opening their uh, uh, borders for the aid to flow into the country. For example, Pakistan had uh, 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 and other neighboring countries allowing the aid from different countries to get access into Afghanistan. Those are kind of the basic minimum things that need to happen. Also, that means the Afghanistan financial system needs to be revived. It remains, it must remain functional. First, because Afghanistan needs to have a stable currency. The price of everything in Afghanistan is correlated with the price of USD. It's simply because Afghanistan imports most of its consumption. So if Afghanistan does not have a stable currency, everything is going to become more expensive and people are going to suffer greatly. And there was a jump recently, uh, there was a currency crisis and we saw a jump in the price of the necessities. And that price was mitigated through shipment of USD into Afghanistan. That needs to continue. Afghanistan need a stable currency, but also people need to be able to conduct, send money back home through remittance to the people at home who need it. And also the traders have to be able to import goods and such. I mean, these are like very basic steps that need to be taken immediately. And it seems like countries are pro very slow to act on these. And I think part of it comes from the lack of interest, uh, honestly. And people, mm -hmm. many would like to move on and not take responsibility for the results that their actions have brought on for uh, uh, for over two decades. Suleiman bin Shah, uh, what is the situation in the country? I mean, are schools open right now? I mean, and, you know, the country faces bigger problems, of course, things like a shortage of food. But is the education system functioning? Teachers have not been paid for one. Sure. So, uh, you know, the, the schools are open for boys only. You know, girls can go only up to six standards. But again, it, the situation varies province by province, area by area. And yes, you're very right. There was some payment to civil servants, but we still have to see details. There's no confirmation whether teachers received their salaries or not, whether they were paid in full or not. But yes, civil servants are unable to, uh, are not being paid, and that's why the inability to, to purchase and, of course, the inability to consume. Barbara Baluch, there was a report released at the beginning of December. It was an alarming report, and it documented more than 100 executions and abductions of former government officials. Um, we also heard that dozens of Afghan uh, military forces from the uh, old government were murdered. Um, when this report came out, the Taliban denied that this has happened, but what do you know of it? I mean, Afghanistan for the last 40 years have been uh, through conflict, insecurity, 
uh, Afghans have seen many ups and, and downs, and I keep repeating that history has really been cruel uh, to Afghans. Each turn it takes, it seems that things are going to get more worse. Uh, and that's where we need to bring back the focus on human rights. You know, we were talking about women's rights. It's important that women are part of that community and, and that society. They cannot be sim simply made to sit sit home. And, and uh, as colleagues were mentioning about uh, the schools, I mean, we, we have established schools around the country for some six million, nearly six million Afghan refugees that were former refugees that, that have returned back home. And, and we keep visiting these uh, these schools. And as you were mentioning, you know, when we go in a girls' class and talk to the teacher, her focus is on her students. And this is yet we are talking not beyond uh, 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 girls' students who are in, in the sixth grade, but these are girl students who are at lower than, than six years. So the teacher is going to tell you, you know, her top priority is to get stationary for, 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 for the students, that they, they, they have some interest in their study, studies. What she's not mentioning, that she has not been paid for months and months. Afghanistan cannot continue uh, like this. Uh, as we, as humanitarians, we have been highlighting before August, 15th, there were 18 million Afghans who were dependent on humanitarian aid. Right. Today, right. that number has risen to 24 million. Most of them have nothing to eat. Harun, I have one final question, and that is both you and Omar were actually on the faculty uh, of the American University of Afghanistan, but of course you're not in Afghanistan right now. Um, you left, but are you able to keep in touch with family who are still in the country and colleagues and friends who are there right now? Absolutely. Um, we do continue to teach uh, um, uh, remotely. Uh, our students are scattered around the world, some still inside the country. And in my personal in my case, uh, my entire family is in Afghanistan, and uh, I'm in regular contact with them. Um, the, the stories, the, the numbers you see and you hear um, are one thing, but when you actually talk to people, the, the heartbreak, the frustration, and indignity, something doesn't come true numbers. I mean, a person who had a job could afford to feed uh, his family, now having to ask other people for basic necessities so his family could stay alive. Um, a family who was able to stand on, 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 on uh, its own feet, now being reliant to go stand in a line to receive food. I mean. Um, the stories are heartbreaking, and um, I'm from a village, and my family members um, uh, in Herat, western side of the country, many of my cousins have chosen to yeah. go to Iran to work, uh, uh, just because there's really no work for them in Afghanistan. Yeah. But that journey is incredibly uh, uh, difficult, and what is waiting for them in Iran is right. often more intimacy. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us on the show. And that is it for this edition of Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.